Good morning. Good to see you. Good to be with you here in the house of the Lord. I'm glad you have come out to worship Him and to spend a little time in His presence and enjoying that and getting the blessings from it and being a blessing to each other and to the Lord together, worshiping Him. Uh, that's why we have gathered. So make yourself at home here at Riverside. I do join me in the bulletins and have uh, one correction, a couple of reminders I want to point out. Uh, not a correction exactly, it's a change uh, last minute. Uh, if you notice, uh, Ken Bateman is not here. They are back from Austria, but he's in the hospital. Um, he had a problem with his AFib and went to the ER yesterday. They're going to do um, kind of what they did to uh, Ruben Earl, the shock treatment, try to get his heart beating in the right rhythm. And um, so he said he's feeling fine. A lot better than he went in. They got a lot of fluid off of him with LASIK, and uh, I think he just... All the walking, all the traveling, and uh, things like that while they were in Europe uh, just got to him, and he hadn't completely recovered from that uh, chest cold. Long story short, he should be home tomorrow, but he's not here. Amanda's sick with uh, on her stomach, and uh, I'm staying home, so there's no children's church this morning, got with the kids. And um, so our Brookdale numbers were decreasing rapidly this morning. And so I'm going to call Brookdale afterwards. We're going to reschedule probably for next week. So no Brookdale this afternoon. Circle of friends. Uh, I'm assuming it's still meeting at 5.30. I thought I saw Linda, but she's not here right now. But uh, is Circle still meeting? Sorry, okay. Yep, okay. Yeah, Circle's meeting at 5.30 in the fellowship hall. So that's for the ladies, their missions group. Uh, Tuesday, we're going to have a deacons meeting uh, at 7, at least that's the plan now. I haven't heard otherwise from Ken. And um, Wednesday, normal prayer meeting. This Saturday, the Baptist men are doing their breakfast, pancake breakfast again from 7 to 10. Uh, men, we're going to get together at 6, I believe, to start getting ready. And uh, that's going to be $7, so make sure you spread the word and invite folks. And then next Sunday, we'll have our regular Baptist men meeting at 8.30. Um, they ask that if you have uh, changed any of your personal information, your phone numbers changed, you've moved, anything like that, or if we don't have it, uh, including your birthdays for the calendar, please let her know so we can put it in the directories and on the calendars for next year. She gives an updated directory every church year, which begins in September. And remember, uh, members, that we have a, a call meeting right after the 11 o'clock service this morning in the fellowship hall to vote on next year's deacons. So please, uh, members, stay for that. It should be brief. Uh, any other announcements? Okay. Well, let's open up with a word of prayer. Holy Father God, we come before you this morning thanking you for this day and time together. Uh, we thank you, Lord, for uh, what you have given us and all that you have done for us. Uh, we thank you for the rain you gave in this measure yesterday and the day before. Uh, we pray, Lord, that you would continue to guide and direct us and provide for our needs. Uh, but even more than our needs, Lord, you've provided for our spiritual need and our salvation. And so, Lord Jesus, we want to thank you and praise you for taking our sins onto yourself, dying in our place, to pay the price for our sins deserved, and to, uh, to redeem us and restore us to right relationship with God the Father if we would but choose to place our faith in you and follow you. We praise you, Lord, because you came back to life after you died. And we praise you because you have ascended and you have guaranteed that you will are, you are preparing a place for us and you will come back again to get us. And so, Lord, for these things, even while this world has troubles, we believe you have overcome the world. And we believe that you would help us overcome. So we ask you to give us that strength and grace to be overcomers to be your witnesses, and to share the great good news with others around us. We ask these things and we give you thanks in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, hymn this morning, the hymn of praise this morning is number 197. Hymn 197. And let's sing the first, second, and last verses. Hymn 197, verses 1, 2, and 4.
board. I'm going to make up for my uh, oversight last week. We were supposed to have a children's sermon on the first Sunday. Just got to roll them with everything and uh, got, got overlooked, and that's my fault. So I want to have it today, guys. Here comes that. <laughs> Listen for a minute. What's this? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure you're talking about. Do you know what this is? Nope, it's something like a seat, but it is. What is this, guys? <laughs> it's a phone. Hey, so I can call people all What else can I do with it? Maybe it's a smartphone or it's an old school like that one. What can you do on a phone? What can you do on a smartphone? You can play games on it, right? What else can you do on it? I can call people because it's a phone. But I can also type to them, right? Text. You can text. What did you say? You can text, yep. Um, can I ask you questions? Have you ever Googled anything? Yep. Have your parents Google stuff for you? Right? So this thing can get online and find out information, right? If I want to find out, you know, uh, when did Columbus sail across the ocean? I can ask it and it'll tell me, right? Or I can look it up and give me a web page about Columbus. Right? You know how it does that? No, not really. There's a black box in my office. And you don't spend out there this either. There's a black box in my office plugged into the wall and that's where it's power and it's plugged into kind of like a phone line that goes to the other phone lines out here and it connects it to computers all over the world that are online. Right, so that's connected by a cable to all these other computers. So wherever someone has typed up information about Christopher Columbus, say on Wikipedia or a, a history page, my phone can find it. But this is not plugged into that black box, is it? Books, no wires. So have you ever heard of Wi-Fi? That's how the phone and laptops and other portable things connect to the box in my office and connect through the box to all sorts of computers. And you have boxes like that at your house, I bet, don't you? You have Wi-Fi at home? So you know what that means? The Wi-Fi is all there are signals all over here that we can't see. And there's more than just Wi-Fi signals. There's sunlight. Rays of sunshine are all over here. You can't see them. But that's how we see each other. You see the carpet and you see the, the furniture and everything else. And there's all kinds of radiation that's harmless to us. And there's air, right? You see the air? You see that breath coming out? Okay. Well, the Bible says when Jesus was talking to Nicodemus in John chapter 3, he says to him that you people have to be born of the Spirit, what we call being born again. And Nicodemus doesn't understand that. He says, Jesus does, the wind blows wherever it wants to. And you hear it sound, but you don't know where it comes from or where it's going. And that's the way it is with people who are born of the Spirit. Right? So the wind blows, right? We can't see it. We can hear it. We can feel it that blows on us. And he said that's the way it is with the Spirit. The Spirit of God is invisible. But it's here. Like the Wi-Fi. Like the sunlight. Or the moonlight at night. And like all those other things that we can't see but are around us all the time. And so the Spirit of God is like that. He is here with us even though we can't see Him. But we can talk to Him. We can listen to Him. We can sometimes feel His presence and what He's trying to get us to do or be encouraged by Him. And so I want you to remember that even though you can't see or sometimes even hear God, you, He is always around us. Just like that air, just like that sunlight in the daytime, like the Wi-Fi, if we have Wi-Fi signals. <laughs> there are all sorts of things around you, but the best one is God. He's always here. All right? 
I thank you guys for coming to listen. Monday should be home tomorrow. Uh, so Deacon, I'm assuming as long as he's feeling okay, we'll have that Deacon's meeting on Tuesday, but keep an eye out for any updates. Uh, Amanda's home. She's been sick on her stomach for the last couple of days, uh, so please be in prayer with her, for her. Uh, who else do we have updates? Yeah. I just want to pray for the Bundy family, for the loss of their son. What? Uh, Bundy family. Lee Bundy, Bundy. lost his son. Family. Uh, many of us were already talking about it, but remember to uh, pray for former President Trump and the investigators in his shooting, uh, the family members of those who lost uh, lives at that shooting. Um, those two people, two people were critically injured last I heard. One died and the shooter died. So um, that young man's family is going through a lot. So of course the other victims are the other victims. Remember that. And uh, just that everybody takes this appropriately and in their response. Yeah. Uh, someone, Melissa. Unspoken. Kim? Yes. Uh, my brother in law, Jimmy, is scheduled for open heart surgery on Tuesday. Um, All right, so a week from tomorrow, Jimmy's having open heart surgery. Are you going about that? Good John Carter. At least he called his husband, John Carter. He was at me back in the hospital. He said Don Carter? John. John Carter. Yes, Lisa Carter. Oh. Yeah, I heard his second surgery went well, but he got sent back. He was in the Virginia hospital. He said it was bad for everything back. But I think he's been in there a couple of weeks. Okay. So continue to pray for Lisa and John. Get on Get on Still with the respiratory? Holy Father God, we come before your throne of grace again, thanking you for the privilege of bringing our concerns to you in prayer. Thanking you, Lord, that your word tells us that we should, and we should do so 
uh, persistently. We pray, Lord, that you would be with these that we've mentioned this morning. We know several people who are uh, about to undergo procedures or are facing upcoming surgeries. Uh, and Lord, we just pray that you would be with everybody involved in each of these cases. Please, Lord, be with uh, the doctors, nurses, and all the support staff, anesthesiologists, and others who are doing the work on our loved ones. And we pray, Lord, that you would be with them and their bodies. Uh, if it be your will, provide healing and success for these procedures. We pray, Lord, that you would give them grace, and especially them and their families as they wait and prepare. Uh, we pray that you would give them peace and graciousness while they wait. We pray, Lord, for those who have an ongoing waiting, uh, longer-term needs like, uh, like John, like people struggling with cancer, uh, with Sandy and the others that we know, and many who have cancer. Lord, we pray that you would give them a graciousness and a steadfastness to continue this fight. And we pray, if it be in your will, that you would give them victory over cancer and provide healing. Lord, drain off excessive fluids and remove tumors and cancerous cells. We pray, Lord, that oxygen levels would flow like they should. And we pray, Holy God, that your will would be done. And to be your will, we ask for healing. We ask, Lord, that those who have lost loved ones would be comforted by you and by your people in the time of grief. And that you would work healing through their grief. We pray, Lord, that as they face the reality of mortality, that they would become aware, if they don't know you as Savior, that they need a Savior. They need to be ready to meet their maker on the other side of this mortal life. And we pray, Holy Spirit, you would give them conviction that leads to repentance and salvation. So, Lord, we pray for the unspoken request and the needs that aren't covered and our typical uh, medical needs, sharing, Lord, things that are private, things that are not ours to share, but we are burdened and worried for our friends, family, or neighbors. I pray, Lord, that you would be with those needs. Help meet them. Provide jobs and financial security for those who have financial needs. Provide emotional strength and a renewed, sound mind for those who have mental health needs. And we pray, Lord, for the emotional needs and the spiritual needs of our friends and neighbors and people in our community. Lord, we pray for our nation that you would bring peace and unity to the divided. And Lord, we know that we may have different opinions on how best to, to run things and policy differences, but let us not see each other as enemies, but see each other as one nation under God, with liberty and freedom of, for everybody. Lord, that you have called us to be, that our founding fathers wanted us to be, and I pray, Lord, that you would protect our servicemen and women and our police force and the investigative forces that try to keep us at peace, that you would give them safety and guidance and the strength to do their jobs. Lord, I pray for upcoming elections, that your will will be done. And I pray, Lord, that our nation would seek you and serve you first and foremost, party last. That you be served and the people they represent as elected officials and then the world and the party's agenda be the one of the last things on their mind. Rearrange our priorities, Lord, so we will be your country, driven by your word and your will. We ask these things in your name for the good of all, because you love all. Amen. Our offer three hymn this morning is hymn number 416. Let's sing all the verses of hymn number 416.
May we all be good followers of that great leader as he leads us along so we can enjoy this blessing and that song he wants to put in our heart. If you would join me in the book of Numbers, we are continuing our study in the life of Moses. In one way, we're almost done in that uh, Moses is going to die soon, narratively speaking. Uh, in another way, in terms of the amount of Bible, we still have the whole book of Deuteronomy to go through. But remember, the book of Deuteronomy is almost entirely Moses' final speech, his farewell address and reminder to the people of Israel about where they come from, what the Lord had done, and uh, his law and the covenant they had made with him. So the Lord's going to reference Moses' upcoming death in today's passage. We're going to read from Numbers 27, starting at verse 12, and then I'm going to go over to do a contrast in 2 Kings chapter 20, which is set during the reign of King Hezekiah and the prophet Isaiah in the land of Judah. But first, Numbers 27, Starting with verse 12, and I'm reading from the English Standard Version. The Lord said to Moses, Go up into this mountain of Abiram and see the land that I have given to the people of Israel. When you have seen it, you also shall be gathered to your people, as your brother Aaron was, because you rebelled against my word in the wilderness of Zen when the congregation quarreled, failing to uphold me as holy at the waters before their eyes. These are the waters of Meribah, of Kadesh, in the wilderness of Zen. Moses spoke to the Lord, saying, Let the Lord, the God of the spirits of all flesh, appoint a man over the congregation who shall go out before them and come in before them, who shall lead them out and bring them in, that the congregation of the Lord may not be a sheep that have no shepherd. So the Lord said to Moses, Take Joshua, the son of Nun, a man in whom is the spirit, and lay your hand on him. Make him stand before Eleazar the priest and all of the congregation, and you shall commission him in their sight. You shall invest him with some of your authority, that all of the congregation of the people of Israel may obey. And he shall stand before Eleazar the priest, who shall inquire for him by the judgment of the Urim before the Lord. Uh, the Urim, and oftentimes joined with it the Thummim, was uh, were devices that the high priest used. They were actually part of the garment. He wore in a secret pocket in that garment. And through those, they would discern the Lord's guidance. It was the only uh, God-approved method of uh, using an item to discern what the Lord wanted them to do. Divination, if you would. So Joshua will have the right to stand before the priest and inquire through the Urim before the Lord. At the Lord's word, they shall go out, and at his word, they shall come in both he and all the people of Israel with him, the whole congregation. And Moses did as the Lord commanded him. He took Joshua and made him stand before Eleazar the priest and the whole congregation. And he laid his hands on him and commissioned him as the Lord directed through Moses. It was a laying on of hand ceremony to confer authority before the people with the Lord's blessing as represented by his high priest that Joshua would be the next leader after Moses. Now we're going to talk a lot about Joshua today, but our focus is still on Moses and his life and what he is doing here as a role model for us. But let's look at 2 Kings 20 as a contrast. 2 Kings 20, verse 14, the king of Judah is a man named Hezekiah, who in many ways is a godly king. He followed the Lord, sought the Lord, and when the Lord told Hezekiah uh, through the prophet Isaiah, when Hezekiah fell sick, Isaiah told the king that he was going to die soon, get his affairs in order, tell your son, and things of that nature. Hezekiah prayed. He prayed to the Lord earnestly, and he asked the Lord to heal him and extend his life. And the Lord decided to graciously extend Hezekiah's life and give him 15 more years. After that, at some point, say, officials came from the distant kingdom of Babylon. They came seemingly as a uh, court visit 
But what they were doing was spying out the land and the treasury to see if this was a kingdom that Nebuchadnezzar, or later Nebuchadnezzar, would conquer, the king of Babylon should conquer. Hezekiah showed them all the great things in his kingdom. He showed them the treasure vaults. He showed them some of the, the golden and precious artifacts that were in the temple. And he displayed the wealth and the prosperity of Judah to their future enemies. So in 2 Kings 20, 14, Isaiah the prophet came to King Hezekiah and said to him, What do these men say? Where do they come from? Hezekiah said, They've come from a far country, from Babylon. What have they seen in your house? Isaiah asked. Hezekiah answered, They have seen all that is in my house. There is nothing in my storehouse I did not show them. Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord. Behold, the days are coming when all that is in your house and that which your fathers have stored up till this day shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, says the Lord. Some of your own sons will come from you, whom you will father shall be taken away, and they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. That word eunuch doesn't mean they're going to become an important servant because they are, are worthy or someone will be treated well. Isaiah's point is they are going to be um, emasculated. They want to have parts cut off, shall we say, to emasculate them uh, so they are no longer a threat and they'll be serving in the women's courts and things like that. They're going to be humiliated, disgraced, emasculated, and made into slaves of the king of Babylon. Then Hezekiah said to Isaiah, the word of the Lord that you have spoken is good, he thought. He said, for he thought, why not? if there will be peace and security in my day. So I show you this passage about Hezekiah because it sharply contrasts Moses. Moses here, a leader of the people, before they are officially a nation, a geopolitical nation, before there was ever a king, he is considering the future. The Lord has told him, you're going to die. Now he has already done his requesting of the Lord, to forgive him of his sins, to let him go to the promised land. The Lord has forgiven him. He's still God's chosen leader for the moment, but he is not going to go to the promised land. But, I, uh, but Moses is concerned for the people beyond his lifetime. Moses shows a genuine love and a genuine uh, depth of his feeling of responsibility and leadership. So he prays to the Lord, Lord, Send another leader after me, someone who will guide them. These people need a leader. And he's seen that, how easily they can go astray and, and things of that nature. Hezekiah, on the other hand, even though his own sons had been prophesied to go into slavery, to have horrible things done to them, to be victims and slaves of a Gentile king of Babylon, Hezekiah says to himself, as long as I don't have to see it, I'm fine with it. As long as it doesn't happen in my day, I don't care. The rest of my rule will be happy and peaceful and fine, at least good enough, so that's fine with me. They don't have to deal with that. That's future Judah problem. So to distinguish the two rulers here, two leaders, one is genuinely concerned about his people beyond his own life and beyond his own limits. And the other is... Though otherwise, in many ways, a godly man says, as long as it's not happening in my time, I don't have to see it, I don't care. And that disturbs me about Hezekiah. You know, that is his children, his grandchildren. He's being told about. That is his people he has led back to the Lord. And yet, he seems not to have a thought after his own life. Even though he has personally seen the Lord change his decree, Isaiah the prophet came to him and said, you're going to die. Before Isaiah could leave the temple, the palace, Hezekiah had prayed and the Lord said, Isaiah, go back. Tell him I heard his prayer. Tell him I'll give him 15 more years. So he knows the power of prayer. He knows prayer can influence God's mind and change some of the decrees from the Lord. Yet he does not pray for his children. He does not pray for forgiveness for this arrogance of showing off his wealth and his country's power and limits to his enemy. He simply says, as long as I don't have to live through it, I'm okay with it. 
obviously Moses is the type of leader, the type of person that we should emulate in this case more than Hezekiah. Moses is thinking of the people, the congregation. One of the reasons I picked this translation now, that just means the grouping of people, but it applies to us, the church. Thinking about beyond his lifetime. What does the church need? What kind of people should the church have for the next generation? Moses is showing true leadership by preparing Joshua throughout these 40 years. Using him as an aid, but also teaching, correcting, and training him. We'll look at how he does that. And so he has a man ready. He prays to God, anoint your man, pick out the leader. I think the implication is, I thought it was going to be Joshua, but you are the Lord. You pick, you anoint. And Joshua was the one anointed to lead, and he did lead them to take over the promised land. He led them in the Lord's ways for another 25 years after Moses died. Moses we don't know exactly when he met Joshua, but when Moses comes back after the burning bush experience, he comes from Jethro's land in Midian, the burning bush on Mount Sinai to Egypt, and he tells the people, "This is I met the Lord, he is our God, the God of our ancestors. He tells them God's going to free them, and at some point in this discussion, he meets Joshua during this time of the plagues of Egypt. And Joshua becomes his servants. We, as readers of Scripture, first see Joshua in Exodus 17. They have left Egypt, crossed. Yeah, they've crossed the Red Sea at that point. Sorry, let me make sure I have the chapters right. And they had their first military encounter with an enemy. And Joshua leads the army. If you remember the story, Moses is up on a higher elevation, looking out over the battlefield, and he raises his hands to the Lord. And while Moses' hands are raised, Joshua and the military wins. When his hands get tired, he lowers them. The tide of battle turns against the Israelites. So his brother Aaron and her, H-U-R, not some random lady, her, H-U-R, um, hold up his arms. And Joshua has victory. So he has proven himself at some point to be a, a capable leader, someone they can trust. And he is then afterwards known as Moses' assistant. Now, they were slaves in Egypt, so I doubt Joshua had any actual experience leading military men in battle. Remember, the Pharaoh was worried Israel was going to turn against him if they fought in battle against somebody and rebel while their military was gone. So he probably didn't put any of the Hebrews in the army. Maybe Joshua had experience leading some of the construction projects, being a, a slave over other Hebrew slaves, a kind of sub foreman. Maybe. We don't know. It may just be he volunteered. Maybe they prayed about it, but the scripture doesn't tell us. Joshua, son of Nun, was the leader of that campaign. Then he served with Moses. He went up on Mount Sinai, not all the way to the top like Moses, but he went about halfway up and he was one of the ones who fellowshiped with the Lord with Moses and Aaron and the elders and they ate with the Lord to ratify the covenant. And then when Moses went all the way up and stayed there 40 days, Joshua stayed halfway up the mountain. He was not involved in the golden calf idolatry. When Moses would go to the tent of meeting to get word from the Lord and talk with God and he would come out, Joshua would stay outside the tent and worship and stay in God's presence as close as he could get. He was a man who sought God, who had God as his high priority, who followed the Lord and served the people of God in the ways he could. So he had a servant heart. He had leadership abilities. He had a godly heart. And Moses saw and encouraged these things. He also was corrected by Moses. No one's perfect out of the gate, right? People need training. People need correction and encouragement. In Numbers 11, Moses asked the Lord to, to give him leaders to help him lead Israel because they were so huge. 
But this was old, and these people numbered in the one and a half to three million, somewhere in that range. So he needed help. And God gave the Spirit of the Lord to several other elders, and they began to prophesy. Joshua got jealous for his master and said, Moses, stop them. You're the prophet. You're the one who speaks for God. They shouldn't be doing this. And Moses gently but firmly rebukes and corrects that thinking. Like, I wish the Lord would give all of them his spirit, make all of them prophets, so they would be close to God themselves and hear the word for themselves. Joshua was corrected and trained by Moses. And we see Joshua's faithfulness when he and Caleb, alone among the twelve spies who returned, said, the Lord can give us this land. The other ten spies said, those people are too big, their cities are too fortified, there's no way we can take it. Joshua and Caleb disagreed and said, the Lord, give it to us. Don't rebel against the Lord. They, even though they faced the same threat in their military might and human understanding, he was faithful and brave to follow God's ways. So we see that Moses had found and trained and conditioned a man to take up the mantle of leadership in the next generation. You may be saying to me, well, that's a nice preacher, but what does that have to do with us? We're not, we're not leaders of a great people. If there's one thing I learned in the couple of leadership classes I had at seminary, is that everybody is a leader in the sense that everybody has influence. Not everybody has a title and an office and things like that, but everybody has a sphere of influence. Everybody is a leader to a degree. They influence other people. So what does that mean to us as Christians, as the congregation of the church in the New Testament? It means that we have a responsibility to obey the Great Commission, to go as we are going, to teach, to make disciples, to baptize new believers, and to make them into disciples that follow the Lord. That is, we are training younger believers to become mature believers so they use their leadership, their influence, their circle of influence to spread the gospel to more people. It means that we as a congregation, the small local congregation on this riverside, have a responsibility to train up younger people and younger believers so they can become leaders, to be more like Moses than to be like Hezekiah. We often get caught up in wishing the good old days were back. We miss the people who made so much impact on our lives and did so much for us. The, the Hills, the Miss Peggy's, our Sunday school teachers who taught us and impacted us when we were youth. We miss them. I wish I could have met some of them. I, I didn't meet Miss Reby's husband. I didn't meet Peggy. There's so many I wish I could have met and seen in their, their heyday of service. But you know what that means is that we've got to become the next Miss Reby, the next Miss Peggy, the next good Sunday school teacher that impacts younger believers so they can become the next deacons and Sunday school teachers and servant leaders and witnesses. We can't think, well, my generation's about gone. As long as it lasts for my generation, then that'll be their problem later. We've got to make sure they're ready to face their problems. Because they'll have them. However good or bad we are, I can guarantee you the next generation won't have problems. Hopefully, we do our best not to leave them with our problems. Some of them inherit a mess, but we've got to prepare them to inherit leadership. We've got to prepare the next generation, spiritually speaking, of Christians to be able to share the gospel with their peers and the generation after them. See, that's, that's God's plan. Jesus didn't come down and make a, a, a textbook of a manual 
He didn't give us a manual. He, he gave us the Gospels. He gave us letters written to churches. He gave us the example of the Old Testament saints and sinners to follow. It is inspired word. But he didn't come and make a seven-step program for how to be a good leader or how to make a church. He gave us the Holy Spirit and the role model of the apostles. So we have to apply that to our problems and teach others how to apply it to theirs. Joshua had to become a problem solver. Joshua had to learn that lesson one example I, I had for you earlier about it's okay for other people to also be blessed and used by God. We're not a one-man leadership man. Moses had to learn that lesson from his father-in-law. He's passing along to his men. Every Christian should be a mentor to a young Christian. To help them in their faith, to help them grow. To make disciples. And so I want us to learn from Moses. Real quick, we try to choose people who have a heart for God. Now we should share and witness everyone, but those we pick to be our, our mentees, that we want to mentor, we should, they should be ones who have a heart for becoming more godly. They want to grow in Christ. Joshua displayed that. When he stayed on the mountain, when he stayed at the tent of meeting, when he saw God, when he acted bravely to follow God in, fa in the face of all of the other mistrust and fear. We see that Moses and the elders of Israel trusted the leader of the next generation to be a leader. Now, I'm not saying right out of the bat we let anybody come in and try anything they want, but they put Joshua in charge of that military campaign. We don't know exactly why, but they trusted him to lead the men in battle. Moses wasn't out there micromanaging which troops should go where, and which uh, division should do what in the army. He was praying and interceding with God on their behalf. He was doing his part, but Joshua did his part. It's one of the hardest things for an older congregation like ours and for older churches to, to let go of some of the in chargeness and the authority, to let the next group of volunteers decide, I want to try this. I think this might meet the need in ways that we haven't before. And sometimes they make great decisions. And sometimes what they try doesn't work out any better. Sometimes it looks out worse. That's okay. <coughs> See, the problem is we've got to be okay with letting people try things and make mistakes, have grace towards them so they can then try other things and learn from their mistakes like we did. Now, we should be there to help, to correct if something is ungodly, to give advice, but they have to be the ones to take it. And it's okay if training is messy. That's all right. Look, if Jesus can cover our conscience, willing disobedience and rebellion against them, his blood can cover mistakes. So we need to be okay with it too. Because we want ours to be okay. We want other people to say, that's all right. You tried hard and your heart was right. It didn't work out. Let's clean up the mess and try again. That's grace. We need to be willing though to give that correction. If our mentees are going off in the wrong direction, if they're getting half cocked and, and reacting emotionally in an ungodly way, like Joshua in his jealousy. Joshua needs to learn that the leader should be humble. That his master Moses, while one of the heroes of the Bible, they already knew he was a great leader and a man that had a unique relationship with God, needed to be humble and not jealous of others who had their part in their giftings. After that combat that Joshua led, the first one, Exodus 17, 14, the Lord tells Moses, remind Joshua. Write these things down and remind Joshua of his victory and that these people are always going to be Israel's enemies. They constantly be on the watch out for. And so we see that we need to remind 
the younger generation of Christians. That doesn't necessarily mean physically younger or older. It means they're, they're learning, maturing Christians. We can remind them of their victories. Remind them of what the Lord has said. Remind them of the Lord's warnings and the word of God and encourage them how God has encouraged them. We should always be about the business of helping other people be better disciples. That's every Christian's job. We want to say, well, that's the preacher. That's the, the Sunday school teacher, but he's the class. That's the deacons. They're our version of elders. They're the ones who, who are the lay leaders. That's not me. I just, I just come. I just help clean, or I just do this. Every Christian is, should be a disciple maker, a witness for what the Lord has done. And everybody has their sphere, sphere of influence. And so whether you like it or not, you have influence. You're a leader. You may not be the head leader. I'm not saying wives overthrow the headship of the house that the Bible says is the husband's. The mom's your leader. Household is the easiest place to see leadership. And it's biblical throughout that parents should teach and raise their children in God's ways. But it goes outside of the house and to those people we meet that we share the gospel with in the church and outside the church for those we can, we can help know the Lord better. And so as we conclude, I, I know this is a weird sermon. It's not a, a come to Jesus. It's not a repent of the sins and get clean. It's not a here's how to live better and that kind of morality. But it is a big part of how we do what God has called us to do as disciples. We make more disciples. And like he does in many ways, not every way, but many ways, Moses shows us a good role model. So we learn from him. So our invitation is not so much of a come get right with Jesus, although if you don't know him as Lord and Savior, if you're not right with him and his follower first and foremost, you need that before you can have a life of meaning and purpose for the Lord. Before your life can help grow the kingdom of God, you've got to become a member of the kingdom of God, a citizen of his kingdom. And so if that is your need, come forward, I'll share with you from Scripture how you can be saved. How you can be part of his kingdom and live in heaven forever. And so the only alternative, which is for the people who rebelled, like the angels who fell, the devil's hell. But maybe you want to come and pray for the people you influence. Maybe you want to come and ask the Lord to help you find someone to share with or witness to if you realize you haven't in quite a while. Maybe you want to become a better influencer and disciple maker. You want to pray about yourself or that person. Please come and pray. Whatever the Lord has put on your heart, please do. Everyone else will be singing, Jesus paid it all. Hymn number 134. We've got a meeting that'll wait. We've got lunch. I know you're hungry. Hold on. We need to get right with the Lord or respond to his call. Come join this church. Now is the time while everyone else sings him 134. Jesus paid it all.